to know that banking does make a difference. And to be able to be part of such a good community, it goes a long way, doesn't it? It goes a long way. Giving back to you guys makes me really happy. <laughs> Just knowing that money going towards a community, there's nothing more rewarding than that.
that's six years ago. How many of you would say that your digital footprint has decreased? Can I show of hands? Yours? Well done. You're the first one that ever has raised the head. I'll, I'll, I'll double check later when we have a conversation about that. <laughs> I think it's true though that for most of us, the digital footprint has increased, and it has increased because it makes our lives easier. It makes our lives more convenient. And that's why I have this credo up here that convenience will always be privacy. So we temporarily get scared and worried by seeing that video clip. Or when we think of the Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook. But you know what? Facebook actually just announced a record quarter once again. And these guys have a tiny, tiny correction in their stock price here at <coughs> that time. But you know, only seven out of the top 1,000 advertisers on Facebook actually pulled out. And you know why that is? It's because Facebook has a lot of attention of people like yourselves and the people you're trying to reach, and still has. So while we have sometimes temporarily shocks, we need to acknowledge where the attention is of the people we try to reach and engage. See, if you look at Google and Facebook together, they make up for about 60% of global digital assets. And Facebook, in comparison to Google, is actually still small. But these two platforms are really good at making sure that they understand how to get your attention and how to help advertisers to get the attention they want to have for the audiences that they seek to reach. So I always say that you have to master a platform like Facebook because they're still a pioneer, still an innovator when it comes to digital advertising. And we need to understand how that platform works because it teaches us so much about all the other social media platforms that we, for example, would like to advertise on. So when we think about attention and where it's at, just here, it's a bit hard to see, so I'm going to read it out for you. These are the top five frequently visited websites in Australia. So we have Google.com, YouTube, Facebook, and Reddit.com. And obviously that list goes on, but it shows us where a lot of the attention is at when we, for example, think of Google. You mostly jump on Google because you have an intent to look for something specifically, and that's why that advertising on Google still works so well. If we think of social media, for example, look at Facebook. These are all Australian statistics. 16 million people are on Facebook in Australia, and they spend a bucket lot of time in a month on that platform. So no matter how big the scandal, that is still where the attention of many people is. And after that, we look at Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, and all these platforms have unique characteristics that all ultimately always come back down to who are you trying to reach? Who is that persona? that you are trying to engage, and on which platform are they going to be on? Because that's your decision point to understand whether you need to be on that platform or not. So customers, as a result of this entire digital revolution, digital disruption, you know, they're more curious, more demanding, and more impatient than ever before. And it's because what we have created this piece on the internet, and social media, and the stories that we now get to share on these platforms, and it's made us incredibly impatient. So as a result of that, if you think of your customers, they will expect to interact with you at crazy times in the future, because that's what we have conditioned them to do. And we're probably all a little bit guilty of that as well. So that kind of leads me to the first trend. I want to share a few trends with you when it comes to digital. And the first one is Messenger. And Messenger is not something new, but it's new for us marketers because when you look at the top social media channels here, a lot of them have obviously a Messenger platform as well. So all the red ones are Messenger platforms. So WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, WeChat, for example. Now, these platforms previously would just communicate with each other, but they now allow brands, obviously, and companies to directly engage with the people that they're seeking to reach. So they can build one on one communication right there in a messenger app. And when you think about that, you obviously don't want to have a message at 2 a.m. in the morning and then feel like you need to respond to that. And that's why we really need to start to think about trend number two, which are the chatbots. 
Now I know you might think, oh, actually, I process a little bit out there. I don't really want to go on and try to figure out, figure out how that works. Works. Well, chatbots. We get a lot of help. There's a lot of funky marketing technology out there that will actually enable us to use these technologies so that there's somebody at 2 a.m., your chatbot friend, that's going to help you with all those inquiries that are going to come. Now, I'm not saying that that chatbot is going to have all the answers in the world, but I'm not a technical person and I programmed this myself fairly quickly. I spent an hour on this, and this is a service called Mobile Monkey where these guys actually allow you to build the chatbot. So if you have a business, and you have a Facebook business profile, and you have a messenger um, application on there, you can install this bot. That means that if somebody has inquiry, you can actually give them very basic first-hand answers and direct them to certain pages, or even keep them in your messenger funnel. But ultimately, for marketers, this is really exciting, because in messenger, we get really high open rates. So it's kind of like back in the 90s when you all jumped on email and you read every single email because you could still manage. That's what Messenger is now. Now the third trend, and this one is not really a fresh trend or not something really that's new, but I think the worry here, mobile only really is, because Google at the end of last year, or the start of this year, I think the end of last year, sort of announced a mobile first indexing. So if your website actually by this point in time is not designed for the mobile experience, then you really have a problem in terms of ranking. I'm sure Dan will share a little bit more about that when he talks about this stuff. But you know, mobile phones, I describe them as the modern crack cocaine of society because if you are a heavy user, you will touch that device more than you touch yourself and more than you touch your loved ones. In fact, about 5,200 times. So a crazy number of interaction that you have with this supercomputer that's in your pocket. Now, if you think, let's say, social media, Think of how you scroll actually through your newsfeed. It's frequent, it's fast, and it's mostly a sound of experience. So how are you going to create content that resonates with that? Number four, voice search. Now voice is super exciting because, can I get a show of hands here? How many of you have, have used uh, voice search before? So we'll say it's about 30% of this room. Now each and every one should actually go home and use voice when they when they get home or when they're done with this little event here. And to get my point across, I just want to say one thing here. Let's see if this works. Okay, Google, what's the time right now? The time is 1.52 p.m. So if you see that, that this, this search display, it's hard to see from the back, but there is not a definition of time anymore. It simply just gives me the answer of the query that I had at that point in time. So voice search will change the way that search results are being displayed, and it will change the way that you and I will interact with these devices. In fact, already by now, about every third search is actually done by voice, because it's faster and it's more convenient. So it's throwing new curveballs at us marketers and us when we produce content for our websites. How are we going to be featured here when somebody asks a question that's related to our business, to our product, and to our service? Now, trend number five, micro-influencers. Whether you are really small or you are really big, it doesn't matter. There's a strategy in it for you. The reason is that we trust people more than we trust brands. In fact, 92% of consumers trust recommendations from strangers over that of, a, of an actual brand. So when it comes to user-generated content, when it comes to influencer marketing, I'm not talking about the big influencers. I'm talking about people that actually connect with what you have to offer, what products and services you have to offer, and what you are trying to sell to those people. Find somebody that actually authentically resonates with your service, with your business, and they have a strong following online, and there you have your first micro-influencer, and you can actually work out deals with them. When we start to look at companies that really help us to have influencers promote our businesses, we have companies like Tribe and Creatively Square. They actually take a step further. They get these influencers to also help us with content creation. Because these people produce content that already resonates with their following. And these are two exciting companies to actually check out. Trend number five, hyper-targeting. How do I give this gentleman the content at the point in time? Do you just want to turn that off and I scream louder? Yeah. 
No? It's okay? I think so. It's fixed? Do this? All right. So I will tell you, how do I give this gentleman over here a message at the point in time when he wants to hear from you and I? Because we have something to offer to this gentleman at the point in time when he wants to hear from us. Not when we feel like we've got to shove the message down his throat. Right? That's the art of hyper targeting, and that's why. Uh, we need to collect all this information and this intel on our customers so that we actually interact with them at a point in time when they want to hear from us. And that's really this philosophy that I have for marketing that we become less annoyed and more targeted at the point in time when people want to hear from us. Now, to give you an example, this was uh, coming from my newsfeed last year. And see, this is a good example of hyper targeting because. I like tennis, I like Roger Federer, and I'm also born in July, so it really triggers you know, some association with me here. Um, the thing is though, obviously this stuff is absolutely flawed because Roger Federer is born in August, so it was a very dodgy ad. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it was relevant to me, and I actually had the impulse to buy it, and I said, wait a minute. So we can become less annoying, and digital can help us with that, but we've got to collect the intel, we've got to get to know who we are trying to go after, and we have to have the right systems in place. See, this is the ultimate challenge. I can give you all these trends and you get really excited, but it's really hard to sometimes to understand where to start and where to finish. So when we look at businesses, we actually understand that about 50% don't even have a digital strategy and a plan in place. But often, they're active digitally. They're posting stuff, they're doing things, but they don't know what they're looking at, they don't know what they're evaluating. And it's, it's difficult, you know, I get that, I understand that. And I've worked with small businesses and larger businesses, and it's sometimes hard to just get a plan in place. And really, out of this frustration, I developed this five-step digital marketing process, which really teaches you in sequential fashion to understand what you need to do in order to get your digital marketing uh, in shape and execute it properly. So I'm just going to briefly take you through the five steps, and then really we're going to sort of zone in onto step number four, which I have a few nuggets for you, and that sort of I agree with the organizing team to talk about. Now step number one is all about you figuring out who you are as a business. What do I mean by that? Well, see, you could be funny or you could be really serious in the way you communicate with your customer, but it depends who you are, who you authentically are. So we take clients through this exercise of developing a brand narrative and really figuring out what their voice is. And it's an important by the step, because if you don't know who you are, then you will struggle to actually communicate and engage with the people that you're trying to reach. And that really leads me to set number two, your audience. Now, for those of you that came to this entrepreneurship seminar about two months ago, it was my colleague Yannick van Gidden, and he spent actually the entire seminar talking about building personas. Now, personas are at the core of everything you're going to do, and I think he told me something about the minimum viable persona need that you need to figure out who that most important persona is for you right now. So that could be the ones that are generating the most revenue for your business. And you understand it so well that you can actually understand what type of content these people will want to hear from you. If you don't know that, you're going to really struggle. See, there are countless businesses that are going to be doing set number four producing content, but they don't know how to speak and they don't know exactly who their personas are. And that's okay, because sometimes we just rush because we're doing our thing, but we need to go back and actually do our homework. Now, set number three is all about the outlines. So it's about figuring out how the persona moves through the buying journey and understanding exactly at which point in time we need to provide them with a certain piece of content along the journey that they'll take from awareness to conversion and to advocacy for our business. So that's ultimately what we want to create and do. So really, in this hourglass, what we do is we develop not just the journey, but we also align that with relevant metrics, conversion points that we need to build in so that we stop and look beyond the likes and the video views and actually start to measure what works and what doesn't. So, so when we see about content, now there's many elements that fall on the content, and I can't cover all of them because if I were to speak about social media, it could be an entire session in itself. So I'm going to talk about process and a bit of content uh, 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 production, and then I'm going to give you a few content creation hacks to finish off with. Now, 
First, we are in a crazy era. Like, we're being bombarded if we live in Brisbane, for example, with about 10,000 marketing messages every single day. Like, that does our head. It's insanity. So, if you look at this, since the beginning of time, so 2003, we've produced 5 billion gigabytes of information. We produce that same information 10 minutes now. It's absolute insanity. It's because you go also to some type of social media seminar and somebody tells you, you go across five times on this platform every day. They don't think about what your business is, they don't think about who your clients are, and they certainly don't think about your budgets and your resources when they give you that advice. So we've got to keep that in mind and really understand that. But the analogy I want to give you that is really empowering is the one of the news group. So if you think of this newsroom, the whole purpose is to actually provide content every single minute for 24 hours in a day for 365 days in a year, right? That's their core mission. And they're good at that because they have a process in place. So whether you're doing three posts on Facebook a week, or whether you're doing you know, 10 posts uh, every single week across uh, five, six different types of channels, and you do the whole shebang, you still need a process in place, and you need to understand how to do it. So let me give you a few pointers. Number one, you actually need to develop a content matrix. So what do I mean by that? I mean by this that by this point in time, you would know, A, who you are as a business, so you know, what is your expertise, what's your thought leadership, what sort of topic areas and theme areas do you want to own in terms of the conversation that you want to own online. But also, most importantly, understanding what does actually resonate with the audience I'm trying to reach. So, if you're an accountant, one of your big themes could be taxes. That makes sense. And then you could have a few angles underneath those, those big themes and say, okay, under, under that theme of tax, I'm going to have, you know, this tax laws <coughs> updates that I'm going to be talking about and going to help the people that I'm serving to sort of process all that information that's out there. But it could be also certain reminders you're sending throughout the years to actually keep the memories of people fresh regarding their taxes and the things they have to do. So where I'm getting at with this is to actually build a matrix, and this is a concrete example of a client that I've worked with. He's a futurist and keynote speaker, so that makes me a little bit more sense than the accounting stuff. So he would actually talk about the future workplace. That would be his big theme. And under that, he would have three angles how to speak about the future workplace. So a workplace that creates a better society, or dealing with a workplace society, or creating a new world of work. These are all similar things that fall under this specific theme. Now, if you are actually able as a business to map this out, you will walk away with 25 pieces of content that are A, relevant to who you are as an organization, but they're also, most importantly, interesting to the people that you are trying to engage with. Right? So it's this exercise I do with everyone in order for them to really know what they should be talking about. And then for you to stay on top of all that information, you can actually walk away and become this true content oracle and own that conversation. And using obviously stuff like Google News and Google Alerts, um, Bazoomo, uh, LinkedIn Plus, to keep on top of any kind of trends or changes in those key topic domains that you want to be talking about. Right? So if you do that well, then I can take you to the next challenge. And that is, OK, now I know what I want to talk about, but how do I get that stuff out? And what type of content should I be producing? See, in this world of content creation, you need to be at the forefront of it. You can't be just sitting there Monday morning thinking, I have no idea what I'm going to post today, but I need to because have all these channels that I'm going to be feeding stuff on. So the idea of the big, big Matrushka analogy here is that we create a big mama piece on the far left which could be a big e-report or white paper, or white paper or a longer blog. But the idea is to create this big piece and then to start to slice and dice this piece into smaller content pieces so that ultimately you're actually sitting there with a suite of content pieces that are ready for distribution. But you did the legwork by producing something that's big and that in an ideal world, and ideal world can give you content for a couple of months, hey, maybe even for half a year, depending on how big you, you do it. So from there, we can think about implementation. And I'm not going for this on speed, but I want to give you as much value as I can in these 30 minutes. So when we go through content distribution, this is all about which channels are we actually going to put our stuff on, what's the frequency when we're posting these things, what's the name, the time we're going to put this stuff out, what's the content type, 
is worth it, sure she does. And how much paid money are we putting behind these initiatives? And last but not least, and this is the things that we will do in step three of the class of digital marketing process, is to actually develop metrics that are meaningful for us to understand whether the stuff is working or not. And here's just a few examples that I've given you as some pointers. This is not the holy grail of everything. All right, my last minutes are all about content creation hacks. So, theory is done. This is the fun bit. Content creation hacks. Number one, see, when I speak digital, it doesn't mean that we're ignoring everything in the real world. In fact, we should leverage what's happening in the real world. Two of the entrepreneurs went to the New York fashion show, but they couldn't afford to actually have the new bikini line feature on the fashion show. So they flew there, they hired three local models and a car. It was 4 degrees outside, they were freezing their last off, obviously. But they were there before the fashion show started. So the entire loose crew that was in front of the fashion show waiting to get in, they saw these three beautiful women standing there and said, we got to understand what's happening here. So this is an offline event, guerrilla marketing strategy that suddenly created a bit of a viralness online. It was a beautiful example for current media that was actually done because these reporters had nothing better than to do than to feature this story because they were waiting anyways, right? Great example for you not paying a lot, but actually getting a lot of traction online. How about this one? How-to hacks. Still people love how-to hacks, particularly if they're relevant for us. So this one has actually 1.9 million likes, 262 million views, and 134,000 shares, uh, sorry, 134,000 comments with 4 million shares. This is how you build a recycled bath. Right? Crazy. But so much way to around that. People care about this stuff. The last one, or the second last one, is working with data. Now, Netflix and Spotify have done this really recently and very well. So they're using your data when you're watching Netflix, binge watching it, and look at this. Two to the 53 people who've watched The Christmas Prince every day for the past 18 days, who hurt you? Or Spotify, the person who plays Story 42 times on Valentine's Day. So they use these things to actually build content pieces and engage with the community in a really funky and fun way. Two good companies to actually check out if you're looking for some inspiration as well. Last one, and Jason from Benio would love this, and everyone else here from Benio obviously as well. This is just an example for producing content at a very basic shoestring budget level, where we ran this competition tied to a national campaign. They had this bubble wrap, uh, bubble wrap insurance campaign. So we had piggy, little piggy bubble wrap items, and people had to guess what the bubble wrap. And we kind of animated this whole thing a little bit. It's a gift, really basic, but it got a lot of traction. And people actually liked it, because the people creating the content really enjoyed it too. So my last thing, and I hope I kept the time, is that in my courses I teach this five-step digital marketing process, and I use it with a range of clients, from small to large as well. But every year in my courses I take on real-world client challenges. So if you are actually interested in putting your business forward and you have some type of openness towards the data, you know, that we want from you uh, for this experiment, I promise you that we're going to deliver some fantastic digital marketing uh, plans at the end of that semester with some practical content pieces and some real strategies that you can take on board following that five-step process. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention.
He's a web author, innovator, highly regarded search industry event speaker, and we're very, very lucky to have him here tonight. So put your hands together and let's do it. Ranking 
CTR distribution curve. I know if I'm on, sitting on position one, I'll be getting close to 65% click-through rate. If I'm on position uh, eight or nine, I'll be getting about uh, 35, and, and uh, with 10, I'm getting a little bit more. So for this client, that's the case. For a different one, on position 10, most likely people get about 5% click-through rate. And I find that the click-through rates are higher there than here. So you might actually lower your rank from position 8 or 9 to 10 and get more clicks. So here's the important questions. What phrases have good search volume? How well do I rank for those phrases? What is my average CTR? Can I outrank the result above me? How much more traffic would I get? Can I get more clicks from the same position? How much? And what financial impact would it have? So very quickly we're going to run through this process. You rank uh, number 10, you're getting 3 clicks. You can calculate that if you jump to position 1, you can get 33 clicks because you know your click-through rate. If your click-through rate on position uh, 1 is 11 clicks, you know you're underperforming by 33%. It's simple math, you can calculate it yourself and understand where your area of improvements are. Similarly, if you're outperforming, you can understand by how much and try to understand what is it that you did to do so well. In addition to this, you can work out, if you move one position up, how many more clicks you can get. It's a great starting point. Once you understand all your phrases and the traffic that would bring, if they were optimized or ranking high, you can sort that Excel sheet. And finally, add conversion rate and the conversion value numbers into the traffic and calculate financial outcomes based on your SEO efforts. Which pages should you be optimizing and which phrases do you be optimizing? So you can sort the entire list by revenue, potential revenue of the gaming, and create tangible reports that drive your SEO strategy by numbers and, and dollars, not just by the gut feeling. So if you're really keen, you can also calculate the difficulty uh, scores, which are supplied to us by APHREFs, um, OpenSight Explorer, Majestic SEO, and providers like that. They can tell you how difficult a keyword is to attain. And then the next step is to understand which phrase leads users to which page. You map and prioritize both phrases and pages, and you have your work out for you. So, you're selling two products. You have different metrics <coughs> impressions, clicks, CTRs, different positions, conversion rate about the same. You understand that on this position you're supposed to be getting 80%, you get only 10. Can you move up? Can you get rid of that? No, you can't. It'll be 80% less. So the thing is, you might have thousand different products offered operating on your online retail shop. You don't want to do this research manually. You want to do it at scale. And many, many different things influence what people will click on. Schema.org, structured markup, but if you put pricing in, in the titles, if you put copyright sign or R, uh, these things might encourage people to click a lot more. So once you've done with your keyword research like this, with your search console data, you can add the Google AdWords stuff, keyword plan and other keyword sources, and predict and create models about what will rank and um, how. And create, of course, your financial scenarios that way. One important thing is when you're doing this type of calculations, exclude your brand. When people uh, search for your brand and uh, uh, find you, they're most likely to click on it. So brand, brand returns are like 80, 90, 100% click through rates. So remove those out before you're running your, your own calculations. Um, I'm probably guessing like 1 to 5% of you will actually try to do this manually. Uh, so I, I'm sharing access with a tool that we're currently developing. It's a third iteration of the process. Which will, it's an alpha version, it's a little bit buggy, but it will give you a lot of interesting information. What you do is log in with your Google account, and that will give it access to the search console, assuming you have one, so you have to uh, authorize it yourself first uh, for your website. And it will run these numbers automatically for you and produce these reports. So, case study local directory, these are the clicks that these guys lost, which was 73% of their organic number at the traffic. And uh, 10 queries were responsible for this much loss in traffic, which was 10% of their total 
and 15% of what total organic non branded. So that's their current traffic. This is what they could have if they fix the top 10 problems on the site. And this is if they fix everything. Of course, this is not going to happen. Uh, but at least they can move one, uh, one notch up and, and receive all these extra clicks. How can they achieve this? Improve the titles, descriptions, and the internet team where possible. Another one. Uh, so we did calculation. That was their current traffic. This is the traffic that they lost due to poor CTR optimization. And this is what they will be getting if they fix it. So we knew exactly how many queries. We knew exactly the percentage of loss of traffic. We knew uh, the traffic loss for each individual keyword, so the screenshot from the tool. And we knew that 80% of the traffic was lost by only uh, 93 queries. So these will be our first focus when we're fixing their SEO. And then finally, we attach the money values and we projected how much the money they will be earning in the case of these SEO problems. And finally, projections for their traffic for the long term. This enabled us to produce a digital marketing strategy that not only says, oh, let's fix everything, it says, let's fix this first, and then that, and then that, in order of priority, in order of uh, priority by potential to earn clicks. So we meant, uh, four months implemented the data collection analysis and then strategy development and then roll out everything in line with the plan. Content. This is a really interesting and I like uh, Tima's um, Matryoshka um, concept. Uh, it works on so many levels. Um, and I'll just show you something. You get content on your, at your work and at home and uh, while you're commuting and, and when you watch and Everyone is shouting content down your throat. Literally everyone, including the micro influencers and your friends. Check this out, check, it, check out this article, check out this video. It's on your news feed, on your social feed, and you're, you're fed, you're fed up. You're experiencing content fatigue. You don't want it anymore. You're vomiting content. <laughs> you stop reading, you skim, you scan, you sample, you seek those quick answers. People don't read stuff. They go to the bottom of the article in the comment section and they're hoping that the answer to their question is in the comments, that the good summary is in the comments. Isn't that right, right? I can see people lining up. You do it. TLDR, too long we didn't read. We are the TLDR generation. So when the open content, start with the conclusion, give them the answer, then elaborate, then do the storytelling. Minimize interruptions. Enable scannability because people will scan the content. Be appealing, offer some value, build trust, and engage. So if one in five people read everything, and the rest, just these guys will skim or just read the Bible. This is the research that we did a couple of years ago, and Nielsen did the same research 20 years ago. The statistics are the same, nothing's changed. Uh, they give different excuses why they skip. Um, and uh, what are the reasons uh, that they might skip over content. But the fact is, uh, nothing has changed. So here's an example of poor piece of content. User query, how to close all running apps on an iPhone. You can't. But looking for a way to close all the run? Duh, I just asked that. So, okay, so Apple insists you should uh, I'm like bored in this perspective. So this red is just blah. It's done. All these words mean nothing. Cut it out. How how to close running apps? One, do this, two, do that. Goodbye. People will leave at this point, and that's fine. You achieve your objective, you inform them. They want to read a little bit more, that's up to them. Guess what happens if you do that? If you do the right thing by the user, Google will do the right thing by you. They will hyperlink you from, or hyperspace you from position 7 into position 0. It will be the feature snippet because you need the right answer very quickly. Traffic from feature snippets is better than ranking number 1. It's ranking 0. You're, you're, above, the, you're above the result number 1. So, inverted pyramid is an old concept that's been used by journalists for a long, long time. Who, what, when, where, why, how, and then important details and all the clock at the end. What's the deal? What's the length of this with Matryoshka's coming? 
mega posts, you know, 2,000 of my mega posts do really well. People share them, nobody reviews them. They say, oh, Dan wrote a big post. It must be really good. <laughs> um, so they, they share it, but well, nobody reads it. So the attrition is, as you scroll down the page, it becomes very, very high. So topics, split it up, make it three articles. So you can say, oh, if somebody lands on this article, you know how long? They don't have the context of this and that. It's called links. It's the web. <laughs> so contextually relevant links connect all your content that's relevant. One paragraph, one idea. Don't mix it up. So if, you, if you're trying to say two things, split it up into two paragraphs. Because people land on a paragraph, say, start reading it, and they say, oh, this paragraph must be about the topic A. And they'll put click in ignore B. I'm not interested in A, I'm going to read C. And you're completely losing at that point. People are skeptics. Not skeptics. They don't trust everything that they read. We did a survey about trust online, and these were the <coughs> elements of what builds trust. I don't have time to go into each individual one, but I will have the slides available to you so you can uh, scan them. And how they decide what's trustworthy. So I asked them, if you could make one rule that everyone who writes on the web has to follow, what would it be? I asked a thousand people, speak the truth. If you want to believe what they're reading is true. Be nice. So that was a surprise. Proofread, cite your sources, etc. No clickbait. So these were the elements that played a role. So the types of content we have need to match the content qualities in order to create that linkable content that people want to share on YouTube. So this is SuperDry. SuperDry sells clothes, and these are their brand advocates and the models. These are the real people behind the company, not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> but their, their customers are not cool also. Their customers want to be cool and look like these guys. But we don't care what they think, we don't care what they think, they're probably not know what to type in Google. You want to know what this guy here, you can type in to find the overpriced jacket. <laughs> so if we look at the data, remember our little calculations and everything, so queries and rank potential and the money, so we've got all the metrics. We're looking at this uh, powered down jacket as one of our biggest opportunities. So this is our landing page. And I'm saying, oh well, you don't need any more blog content. Please do not, I, I don't need you to blog anymore. Fix what's written in here. Just basic SEO stuff, fix that part. Make it a work of art, and then fix the next product, and the next product, and then every category, and every product, and every category, until we reach the one that's not worth fixing, and then take it off the website. Really broadening. So how do we actually fix it? So here's the, some of the keywords that are mentioned in this content. Ask people. So you'll have your primary term and your long tail, but you can never predict the new things. Like Google said like 30% of the queries enter today were never typed in before. People keep coming up with new things to type in Google. You can imagine. So I ran an open-ended survey with Google surveys with an image. I showed them the jacket and I said, describe this jacket, what is this? How much would you like to, to find it? Pop, pop, uh, yellow, ski, winter, cute. Yes. <laughs> so we're cute in there. Their competition was using the word papa. So that's the query set. Remember keyword broadening? The uh, query set is down. But we also got puff and winter. So why not get all this extra traffic rather than trying to rank extra high for the keyword down? So all that stuff goes in there. And this concludes our content session. How much time do we actually have for that? Ten more minutes. <coughs> okay. So now we're to the, to the first part. You know, when people chase rank, they want to get links. Why do they get links? Well, this is how Google works. They treat every page on the internet as a node. And another page is a node. And between the no nodes, there's a directed edge. So that's a link. One page links to another. That's a bullet from this page to that page. That's a link graph. Pages link to pages. But when pages link to pages, Google calculates who gets linked to most and from which authority page, and they calculate 
I can make the centrality, which is called page rank. And that's, that, that's how they figure out who's important on the web. Somebody I was talking uh, to before, they said the problem with Google is that they're finding what's popular and not what's really good. Well, Google is a machine, they don't really have a good idea of what's good. We have perception. So they're trying to figure out what's popular. So here's an interesting concept. Reverse guest blogging. Rather than me going out there and writing guest posts and getting links back to your website, ask people to write for you. But find global blogs influencers. Those who have maybe 20, 30, 50,000 followers on Twitter um, and are more likely to um, reply to your request. <coughs> Get them to write something for your blog. Okay? You'll see the likelihood of them actually sharing that post with their um, audience is very high. Debunking existing claims. Um, I'll leave these uh, snippets with you to read in more detail and research. But these are really effective link building methods. So you're going out there saying, I found something completely different to what we were. Here's my data. What do you think of that? Supporting claims and agenda. Hey, I see your word about this topic. I found the same. Look at my data. What do you think of that? Influence input for blog posts based on white papers. So you, you, you find something, you structure an awesome piece of content, and then you get micro opinions. Featuring different people and their opinion in your content. They feel like they're part of it now, they're more likely to share it and do it. I have a favorite paid organic hybrid. You're not supposed to pay for links, but there's a little bit of a workaround. So I'll try to go quickly through this one. This is Windu. They have they're a competitor to Airbnb. Uh, price photos, owner of the property, features, address, pretty unremarkable. So what I wanted to do is find ways to get links to those boring pages. So what did I do? I said to the locals living in Sydney. Sydney was highlighted for uh, various research populations as a top, uh, top destination. What's the best place to live in Sydney? So we ran a survey, we asked people, and the top answer was McDonald's. Side, okay, but I have a story, and I structured the story using the inversion pyramid, and I just put the drive back in there. I'm not publishing the story, I'm giving the source of news. I'm feeding it to journalists through social media. I'm advertising to journalists and influencers, including bloggers. I'm paying for the clicks. <coughs> so I'm structuring micro, micro targeting ads in Facebook, targeting employees of Sydney Morning Herald and Brisbane Times. They're seeing my ads. So that's resulting in actual links. And the client gets a link in the second paragraph. I would have been happy, uh, happy with just a mention. Um, same thing we did in the Philippines, for Manila Times, um, some smaller bloggers for a local accountant here in uh, Acacia Ridge. Um, we did it internationally, and just yesterday, or well, yeah, I think yesterday, we appeared in Sydney Morning Herald because um, uh, I had some statistics that I've discovered about the voice search that you spoke about. So they used, they found the article, and instead of quoting that article, they interviewed me. And I gave my opinion on, on, on a number of topics, and they included and I got a great, great media mention, not just my name and the location, but also what I do and the brand name. Who picks up those things? And they work similar to this. So, this is now syndicated to other places as well. So, um, the message that I try to leave with everyone when I uh, do talks like this is don't be chasing links. Don't go begging, oh, can you please link to me? Fix your content, fix your relationship, work on your brand, make sure you have something extraordinary. Not just another piece of content that you have to publish because it's Tuesday and Tuesday you publish in your blog post. As somebody said, you need to publish a lot of content because Google likes that. They like fresh content. They like good content. So, perfect, uh, perfect quote to leave with you. Don't go chasing links. Create a reason for the links to exist. Thank you. Thank you again, and Timo. I don't know if you can come back to the best product. Like thank Timo for showing me that my country is not the best product. Like just for you. Uh, I'm not that one, so that was very nice to see. Uh, we'll open the session for questions now. Does anyone from the audience want to start kicking off? Do I have any of these ideas?
sure it's perfect. But um, the most interesting thing that happened there is I created a new innovation. I call it hypotex. And when people open up the article, it's 400 words. But it's a 2,000 word article, maybe 4,000 word article. So what happens is I use 40 elements, data expanders. So when people um, go over a link, click, expand. So they can navigate through rather than facing a huge piece and going, oh, how do I have time to read this? I'm, I'm tricking them into landing on the page and then rather than opening new tabs. That's the distraction I mentioned. Don't, don't give them distractions, I think. That was a, uh, start with conclusions. Oh, right. So minimize interruptions. And a link within an article is an interruption. Takes them away to a different page, a new tab. So what I did, I, I brought it into extra content in line. Okay. Um, so I enable scalability, breaking out the paragraphs, doing different headlines, bullet points, all the keywords, to make it easy to, to scan. Um, I was appealing by having a, an interesting com uh, topic and offering value, that research and sharing that research with them, built trust because I supported everything that I said in a source file. I provided the CSV file of the entire survey so they could download themselves if they don't believe what I'm saying. Um, and of course, uh, being engaged in that's a whole new ball game, you know, how to be engaged in your content. Um, so then I did what's best for the users, engagement rates through the roof. People are actually spending, instead of six minutes on average on the page, they're spending four minutes. Can you believe it? Twelve minutes on a page reading, on average out of, say, 4,000 readers. That's extraordinary. So, then later on I found out that none of the content that's hidden behind the tab, accordion, or elsewhere in, you know, did expand it, none of that content will rank in Google. So, if any of you have content on your website that's hidden behind a tab, or needs to be clicked to be expanded, right now it doesn't rank. It's indexed, it's there, but it doesn't rank. There's a question there. Um, interestingly, coming through the, the two discussions, one of the things that I was concerned about when I started my adverts <coughs> was that I was getting no clicks, and I had no idea why I started off. And then after a couple of different hours, I discovered that people were picking costly net up to pay or whatever it was. And our response time I received was like four and a half seconds. So we spent a huge amount of money and there wasn't even an opportunity to catch it. These people are quick, they waited for their death. And when I look at our original accounts, it's a lot better. Half a second in the US, second and a half across Europe, and about two seconds in Australia. I realised that I've spent a lot of energy on content and keywords. I know what keywords are, and I know who our customers are. But despite the fact that they're um, aspirin products and they're probably in their 50s, and they most likely are, if I didn't get that time, those times down, I got no response from that advertising. So, if you want to go through a very painful experience tonight or tomorrow, install um, tracking code for Lucky Orange. It's a website called Lucky Orange. Lucky Orange. Lucky Orange. We're in time. The domain was available. So um, you install the script on your website and then you record every user session. So you can play back. You'll actually see what's going on. It's, it does wonders for giving you initial ideas when you want to test different conversion optimization hypotheses. 
tens of thousands of clicks every day that you probably don't want to watch all those sessions. <coughs> but if you run a small website, it'll give you a lot of good ideas where to start testing. And then uh, there are, there's a range of tools available to you to do A-B testing and to try um, to try to see one of them is unbounce, um, which will help literally work for the next sense. Um, it will help you design pages that convert. So we run a previous test, A or B. B is the loser, run A. Run a new test, A, B again. Now this one wins, run again. So six months of testing, you'll have perfection in terms of conversion really with your landing pages. Um, because you're burning money in AdWords and the people are landing and nothing's happening. So it could be a number of things. You could be targeting the wrong people. Money could be going to uh, inappropriate audiences, uh, or you could be you could be just you know the layout of the website, the, the appealing element is not there. Yeah. So the time element though is, is clearly was really important because our, our picture rates have gone from 100% our bounce rate from 100% to now about 65. Is your website slower than it? It should be now. It was. You said it went down to two seconds, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. It, it was initially, um, and that's why I raised it, was because we spent quite a lot of money just going, oh, okay, is that worth it, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but not necessarily. It depends on what business you're in, how big your audience is, like just jumping into that. Whereas, I mean, depending on the keywords you're trying to rank for, this could cost you a fortune, and it's really not the best source of generating traffic to your page. So I think back to some of those fundamentals would be my, my first uh, a coaching session in terms of understanding actually the business and the audience and even if you already have a firm handle of who those people are, that's probably a good place to start. And then really be evaluating, you know, within the suite of digital channels, not just, you know, searching on Google, but thinking of um, email and various social platforms. Um, thinking about where these users are actually spending their time and what are you selling, what are you offering, and when is that relevant, when is that contextually relevant to those people are all questions I would ask. You know, like some practical example, if you think about a speed in business, I would not say that you need a, a flamboyant social presence. I might even say that you don't really need a social media presence, but you certainly probably want to be actually on Google and, 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 and rank it if you can afford it. Um, so, I don't know, you know, you always have to come back to the fundamentals to, to make wiser strategic decisions. If you run a transaction, I think inquiry, if you, if you just make an inquiry, um, often it's okay to have an HTTP site, <clears throat> but if you have a transaction happening, or like a purchase or a sign up, or uh, the, the, the money needs to be exchanged, if you're not running on an HTTPS, People will just bounce straight away. So it, be, it doesn't have to be a design thing. It could be uh, the site response. It could be the, is the lab responsive or not, on all the devices. So investigation can be uh, done. Well, for example, uh, for one of our clients, my AdWords team said, shut down AdWords, run Facebook ads. Because ROI was there. Um, we find that, you know, like for some businesses, LinkedIn might be the best option. Um, um, LinkedIn is quite expensive actually. We reserve that for only very specific types of businesses. But Facebook often does not just in terms of the conversion of daily. Um, yeah, they have a they have pretty robust advertising platform. LinkedIn is still a great for organic reach though, in yeah. comparison to that, but expensive to you think of a pay strategy. But yeah, um, some more questions. Timo, um, if you have small business like some of us have, um, you put up a slide that said 90 percent of consumers trust recommendations from strangers who are influencers. So if you have small business, how would you find the quality loss influences like you say? Yeah. Well I'll probably actually this is where it's still the hard work you know comes to play. Like you actually have to do the research. So you don't want to hire one of the agencies to do the work for you, then you really gotta scout the net yourself with different platforms. So they are asking, you know, what, what business are you in? Building. Building business, right? And, and, and what, what specifically they're running? Building houses or high uh, rises? High rises. Well, you must, must make a decent living out of that. 
Um, well, see, I think the influence of strategy in that particular context, I mean, certainly I would still look at the, like, you are you all in, so is that most you need to be in? Yeah? So, I mean, you know, you've got, got to think twice about the influence of strategy potentially around who would give thoughts. Famous so. architects. Famous architects. Or borderline famous architects. Well, any architect that would have, have, have a following at least digitally, right? Otherwise, the influence is, well, no, not necessarily. I mean, they could be well connected to the community and they spread the love on behalf of you at an event, a trade show. That could get you really far. You know, it doesn't always have to be just an online influence, just so to speak. But, yeah, I think, you know, a good strategy would be to actually find some of those key potential architects or other famous builders <laughs> that have walked the, the, the path before you and a way that have a good relationship with you as well and that are willing actually to share the love potentially. And I think that's for you guys to add a micro bit in front of it. I would say to actually sit down with that person or direct message that person and say, look, I'm interested, I'm interested to work with you and actually use you as an influencer um, and then make them perhaps an offer uh, that, that, that is appealing to you, you can afford, and see how they react. You have nothing to lose, and, and probably there's plenty of artists in Australia that you could direct message and see how they're sort of feeling about that whole idea in the first place. They tasted the blood, though, and they asked me for more money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think everyone, everyone knows now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, we have yeah. an we, See, we had influences long before we talked about influences. We just didn't label it that way. Now everyone thinks they can become an influencer. But having said that, if you have something to offer, you know, like you're, you're in a clothing business and people really like your stuff and they really resonate with the things you know, you're selling, um, then it doesn't have to break the bank. But I probably need to do some more thinking on the, on the, on the building good. The building. Shall we the last question? Thank you for It's regarding um, number two dot, the minimized interruptions. Um, I'm a frequent blogger, um, I'm also an author and I'm going on to relaunch my YouTube channel uh, tomorrow or the next day. Now, and I was going to do four links to different parts of my blog. One would be to the channel, one would be to my trailer, one would be to my, new, my newest um, uh, writing, how to do writing, another one would be to subscribe. Now, do I put all four links, or do I just do subscribe? I think it, make, um, I think it makes sense for you to do all four. All four? Uh, there are going to be um, huge interruptions in terms of um, people's experience on the website. Um, and, uh, of course, they're, they're very relevant and potential in connecting people to your other assets. So, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, that said, um, the, the links within a content piece are not the only interruption. They're sometimes welcomed by readers. And they can have they can add a lot of value. It's just that you can sometimes lose the readers to a piece that you link to. Um, the interruptions are multiple, so that you could have different design elements, ads popping up, people hate hate ads. I know a lot of bloggers make money for ads, uh, but we need to find the right balance. But in terms of linking and promoting other things, it's not really problematic. I think that the more, most important thing is the, the first point is to storytelling is okay, but if you if your article is about it's not just about your journey, if your article is about offering advice or tips or something, then get on with it first thing. Yeah, same goes for video. I'm trying to feel about that, but just to add to that point, I also think visuals work really nice in blogs, so I'm not sure how much you're working with that, but a lot of the, I don't know, fruit bloggers, for example, they would now, I think you touched upon that, rather than just developing new content, you really, you know, polish your existing stuff. So going back and thinking about, okay, I really didn't spend a lot of time writing this piece, we all know that fruit content creation takes a lot of time, so we have written good stuff, how can we enrich that? So if I'm doing, you know, the, 10 steps to cooking a nice uh, pasta, pasta or whatever, carbonara. Um, how can I actually document all these steps and do take visually appealing photos that can really make it more readable, keep people engaged and talk about engagement and make that experience a bit more customer friendly or uh, engaging, so to speak? Google now offers, if you, if you don't know what the topic of the blog is, since you mentioned recipes, uh, Google offers recipe uh, markup for the structure.
should extract to that. So um, on schema.org, you'll be able to see also on Google's pages, you'll be able to see what type of structured data they're offering in their search centers. One of them is recipes. So if you have a offering recipes, you can actually get a little handy picture and the uh, ingredients and cooking time. And uh, if, you're, if you're running a foundation business, you can get your star ratings and the price. Um, if you're selling courses, um, offering courses to students, you can have course markup, which works for mobile phones. Um, there's a lot of little um, things, attention seeking things that you can achieve with the service standards. Just one way to think about all those questions you start to ask your phone, or if you have an Alexa device at home or Google Home, um, and think about the interactions you're having and the type of content you're putting out there. What are those questions that the people you know you're trying to reach? What are the questions they have? And then try to think about you know, stuff that they will show in the snippets. Uh, can you actually provide content like that that will still be ready for it? Because um, that's certainly where there's a lot of opportunities to be right now. And if you actually search yourself, you will often see that there's no snippet as an answer. Because, but you're not going to be the only one that's asking that question. So if by coincidence you actually figure out the top 50 questions that people are asking in your respective context, you have actually a good chance right now to rank for this stuff, which is a probably exciting one in life to hold with you right now, and then it's going to be going very soon. <laughs> Thanks to my Dan for uh, sharing your insight and advice and answering these questions. I'd like to answer the topic you were in this early bit of time. If any of you would like to ask them some questions, then or contact them to one of our social media profiles, or just catch them while we're in the side. That's going to be free. Um, I would like to ask Jason to
and really, at the end of the day, what are the two most important things in business you think, guys, ladies and gentlemen? Money. Money? Oh. And clients. Did someone say clients? Yeah. So we need clients to give us money so we can pay the bills, pay our digital marketers, keep everything running, and uh, keep things going. So we're really motivated with our events to be able to have our exhibitors come there, showcase their business. It's a day where you have about 150 exhibitors in a market stall style. Hey, so let me ask, has anyone been to our events before? Yeah? So you, you, you know the feel that I'm talking about. And this is not a, a day where it's someone standing back here on their phone talking. This is a day of communication, collaboration, talking, uh, generating uh, leads and being able to go and have meetings and make more sales. That's what we're really committed to. So if anyone is interested in coming as a guest, uh, I've got some flyers here, but even if you want to make a note in your diary, it's July 13th, uh, the Logan Business Expo. Uh, I've got some flyers there and there's some flyers out the front. If anyone is still interested in exhibiting their business at the event, it is all of $350. I know it's very expensive, isn't it? What would that be? One client, maybe? One house? Anyway, so $350 to exhibit, and that gives you the opportunity to be there, showcase your business, uh, collect a whole lot of new contacts, and uh, very hopefully help turn that into a whole lot more business for later this year, going into next year. And we also run workshops around the expos to help prepare our exhibitors to know what to do on the day to be able to effectively interact communicate and uh, actually turn it into a real business, which is what we're all about. So thank you very much for your time. I've got some information here, so I hope to see you there on the 13th. Thanks, Thanks sir. Sir. And the last one, we invite Holly from the Logan Economic Development. I'm sorry, the Logan Office of Economic Development in the short presentation of two minutes, and then we'll get started. Last but not least. So this is us. So I'm Holly, I've got my colleagues Harry and Mark, and then the front row. Um, so we look after the businesses in Logan, so if you need support for your business or you need connections into government programs, events, workshops, um, any of that sort of chat, please come and see us tonight. Um, we're also sponsoring the business expo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but we'll have a stall there, so you can come and chat to us there as well if you want some support for your business. But I just wanted to, while we're on top of the digital marketing, the state government offers a program called the Digital School Card. So you can go and rank your business against other businesses in your industry about how you've got your digital presence looks like. Uh, and they also run workshops that we host for our venues in Logan. Uh, to, to ask you in the digital space. So come and grab one of these postcards as well and um, yeah, uh, have a look at you, analyze your digital presence um, as they start with everyone else. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, that's fantastic. Thanks for us, we'll chat to you later. Thank you. To close the session, I'd like to show everyone that our next session will be about IT and cybersecurity, which is very important to secure the content that you make or will make. So make sure you show up for the 24th of July. Please fill out the feedback forms as we do look at that, and we do make sure that we try to incorporate the people within into our sessions. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. And as said, Tremio.
six years, $60,000. Really, you helped us in maintaining our record of no license and chimney flags. We've been lucky enough to see 40 or 50,000 dollars from the community grants, and it's made the club really what it is today. We work with the local high yeah. school students, and we can't do it without the support of the bank, and we can't do it without the support of you, so thank you. These are the sponsors for around about 150000 yeah. Bendigo 